Hi friends, uh, the little Nikki video took way longer than I was expecting it to, um, and part of that's just because it's summer, and I'm lazy, and all I want to do is watch movies and play Saints Row, um, but part of it was genuine scheduling conflicts and technical issues, um, even the version that exists now is not exactly where I wanted that video to be. Um, so today we're just going to take it easy, a little bit of a semi-unscripted video. I have an idea of what I'm going to say, but it's not really written down. Um, we're going to go back in time, get a little nostalgic today, and we're going to look at some stuff from my childhood that has not held up. Um, in no particular order, not even a top ten. I think there's seven or eight things I wanted to discuss. It's just, you know, whatever I could come up with. And and I feel like there's no more obvious place to start than Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. <laughs> Not a new revelation, I know. A lot of people my age seem to have something of a nostalgia for the Star Wars prequels. And I can certainly stand by some of the stuff in Episode Three. Um, not the dialogue or the performances. Frankly, I think... Lucas needed to hand that script off to a better director to make. But I mean, story-wise, I think Anakin's turn to the dark side is very well done. And you can see the actors trying to give a good performance. When they're not reading Lucas's inane dialogue and just giving a facial performance, it's pretty good. Uh, episode 2 I find less defensible, although some people seem under the impression that this is the worst of the three. Which I don't even know how you can say that when Episode 1 exists. Yes, Episode 2 is unfocused, it's got way too many ideas, uh, all of them underdeveloped, and yes, it has some pretty terrible dialogue, just like all three of these movies do. But Episode 1 is just shockingly bad. When I was a kid, I accepted this movie because it was another Star Wars movie, and I loved Star Wars, so how could this movie be bad? And there was a long stretch of time where I didn't watch any Star Wars movies, I think just trying to distance myself from the Star Wars geek I was in middle school. But with the release of Episode 7, I decided to go back to the series, and I was aghast at how terrible Episode 1 was. Uh, apparently Lucas thinks his audience is a bunch of dumb babies. There are fart jokes, there are shit jokes. People have called Jar Jar a racist character, which I never really got. He's just kind of annoying. Although there are definitely racist stereotypes in this movie. Uh, most notably, uh, the Chinese stand-in Newt Gunray running the evil trade federation, and Watto, the greedy, hook-nosed bug with a Jewish accent. That just... Oh, Lucas, what were you thinking? Even the pacing is bad in this one. It's paced like a video game. Cutscene, fight scene. Cutscene, fight scene. Cutscene, 20-minute race scene. <laughs> Really, I, I don't understand how anyone could say Episode 2 is worse than this. When Episode 2 has far less Watto, far less Jar Jar, far less Trade Federation. And on top of that, no fart jokes and no shit jokes. I mean, making fun of this movie is kind of passe at this point, but I just wanted to bring up how amazed I was at how bad it was upon a revisit. And speaking of really easy targets, let's talk about Thomas and the Magic Railroad. I think to properly talk about this, I have to discuss another thing that's a bit nostalgic, but also really hasn't aged well. Uh, that being the reviews of Doug Walker, aka the Nostalgia Critic. It would be revisionist history to say Doug had no effect on me. Uh, his content definitely put me on the path to making this channel. Even if his biggest contribution to that was just introducing me to better content creators. 
That said, when I first discovered his stuff, I was kind of into it, and to be fair, it was a lot funnier then. I was mostly watching reviews of movies I had seen, and when I saw he had reviewed Thomas and the Magic Railroad, my reaction was, what an asshole. Doesn't he know that movie's for, like, five-year-olds? I mean, I saw this movie when it came out, and my only thought on it was, I like trains. But after watching the video, I think it remains by far his funniest video, due in large part to just how batshit insane this movie is. And after his review, I have gone back and rewatched the film, and I, it's just amazing. If Peter Fonda, who I don't think was told this was a Thomas movie, he is so fucking melodramatic. He is just going for it. He wants an Oscar for this film. We have Alec Baldwin, who's just gone completely off the rails, although, to be fair, that kind of fits the tone of the movie. You have child actress Mara Wilson, who's just at that age where she doesn't care about Thomas. I mean, if I was her age, I'd probably think this is super lame, and you can tell she does too. She does not care about this movie. I've actually heard there was some trouble with the production of this movie, a conflict between the director and the studio. They cut out an entire character, this Russian villain who drove the evil diesel car. They also recast several of the characters because they were, and I quote, too British. It's a British show based on a series of British books. Of course it's British. The director of this film, a very acclaimed producer on the show, a lot of people credit her with making Thomas what it was, was very unhappy with the final product. Uh, although, without really knowing all of what was changed and what was left in, I have to say I don't think anything she could have done would fix this. I'm gonna fact check myself here and say the villain was in fact not Russian, he just had a very deep, gruff voice and the studio was afraid that was going to scare children. Also, the director of the film I referred to as being a very prominent producer on the show. Uh, in fact, she was the creator of the show. I think what was confusing me with that is that she didn't write the books, so she is not Thomas the Tank Engine's creator, but she is the show's creator. Also, I said they recast several characters, um, I'm referring to Thomas the Tank Engine, the main fucking character. And also, I think James and maybe one or two other characters. And I knew that while filming, I just didn't say it. So what happens when you shoot without a script, kids? There's this bizarre part of the film where they fake audience interaction? Like, you know, you're watching Dora or Sesame Street and they tell you to say the letter of the day or the Spanish word of the day. Thomas of the Magic Railroad tries to have that by saying, oh, we might need your help. And then they just use it as a deus ex machina to save Alec Baldwin's character at one point. He, he falls on like a pile of bags and he's like, wow, did you do this? No, Alec. No, I did not do that. I didn't do jack shit in this movie. I mean... I guess it's better than the Oofy Loves demanding you get up and dance around the fucking theater. And frankly, there's just not a lot of Thomas in this movie, which is the only reason I went to it as a kid. Granted, I, I guess there was enough for me to pay attention. I didn't know the difference. It was Thomas. I love Thomas. So I guess it's permissible in that context, although what is not permissible is the movie based on another show that I did not like nearly as much as a child. Barney's Magical Adventure. Let me make sure that's the correct title. My bad, it's Barney's Great Adventure. Barney is the first show I remember outgrowing. Like, I watched Sesame Street till I was in like third or fourth grade. I, I watched Veggie Tales through middle school. But Barney, I just remember watching it one day with my younger brother and going, Wow, this is really boring. I'm gonna go in the other room and play with my toys. It was just this wild revelation where I realized just cause something was on TV didn't mean I had to watch it. Please don't ask why I've gone back and watched Barney's Great Adventure. Just trust that I have. And trust me when I say, 
There were people on this who weren't told it was a Barney movie either. The cinematography in particular, this film is shot like a horror movie. There's like a scene where Barney jumps out of a shower and grabs a kid. D did they know Barney was not a horror franchise? Because uh, uh, when you read up on who they wanted to direct this, they tried to get John Landis because of his work on American Werewolf in London and South Park creator Trey Parker, who granted had not made South Park at this point, in fact he turned down the directing job to make South Park, uh, so I guess they were just going off his success on Cannibal the Musical. This movie, man, do not show it to kids. It's fucking terrifying. I know there are people who found Barney scary as a kid, I was never one of those, but I think if I had seen this movie, I might have. And speaking of, I want to talk about uh, two VHS series from my childhood. For the internet, uh, you basically had to have a deal with a studio to get your show and or movie out. But somewhere in the late 90s, people figured out, Oh, hey, we could just put this on a VHS and mail it out to people. Uh, of course, the most successful of these being VeggieTales which is a show I think still holds up today, honestly. What does not hold up so well was the VHS series The Wacky Adventures of Ronald McDonald. Uh, you might have seen Quentin Review's video on this about a month ago, although I've been working on this list for about two or three months now, so its addition to this list precedes his video. Although he does bring up some good points that I probably would not have. So you have to understand, this is one of two VHS series my grandmother had, and my grandmother lived about three hours away out in the country, so visiting grandma was usually an overnight stay, sometimes even longer. And at some point, especially in the days before widespread internet and mobile phones, uh, you'd just go, whatever's lying around, let's do it, I'm bored. <laughs> This led to my brother and I playing chess or Parcheesi and watching every VHS she had hundreds of times, which included The Wacky World of Ronald McDonald. She had two episodes, a camping episode where they end up in a haunted house, and fuck if I can remember what the second one was. Think something about aliens, maybe? That was an episode. I don't remember if it was the aliens episode or not. One thing that struck me about Quentin Review's video about this is that he played clips of songs from the show, and I still remember a lot of the words to those songs very vividly. And they're not memorable songs. My brother and I just watched this so many times, the words to those songs are ingrained in my memory. It didn't really occur to me how weird this concept was until years later. I mean, I never would have watched a show about Colonel Sanders or, or Captain Crunch. A case in point food fight or that terrible Geico Caveman show they tried to make. But McDonald's has enough characters and is such a big part of everyone's childhood that they could just make a cartoon about these McDonald's characters without really even promoting the food. I recall no mention of McDonald's burgers, or any menu items, or Happy Meals. They never encouraged us to go to McDonald's, they just said, here's the McDonald's characters doing shit. And this show is so surreal. I have no clue what's going on in all of these episodes. I'd like to remind you, the episodes I watched were about them going camping and getting trapped in a haunted house, and them encountering Aliens. And there's a part in one where Ronald just pulls a door out of nowhere, and a, a bear runs into it? I don't understand. I'm actually gonna cut in for a second and talk about the characters in this show, because I forgot to. It's what happens when you shoot without a script, kids. Uh, they've replaced Grimace in this show with Patrick Starr. And to be fair, none of these characters really had very defined character traits, so to some degree, they could kind of do whatever they wanted, but I don't remember Grimace just being Patrick. 
He's just Patrick in this show. That's his thing. Birdie in this show is very eloquent and high class and she, she doesn't like this peasant stuff. Which is not what she was at all. She was a pilot from what I remember. Although again, I, I couldn't tell you jack shit about her apart from being a pilot. Also, weirdly, there are these chicken nugget characters. But but also, isn't Birdie a chicken? So, uh, could you cut up Birdie and make more of these little nugget characters? What the fuck? There's two human characters. I don't know why they're in this show. I think it's that old trope of studios thinking kids want to see other kids in their cartoons. Which is not true at all! Stop doing that! Kids don't care about other kids! Beyond that, the character designs are just awful. We were living in a post-Rugrats world and all that rough, lumpy style worked for the Rugrats. It didn't work for anything else that was not Rugrats. Especially this show. These are already well-designed characters. There is no need to recreate them in your grotesque image. These are literally characters stolen from Sid and Marty Croft. Look that up, that's true. McDonald's stole their characters from Sid and Marty Croft. What a scuzzy corporation. <laughs> and you'd think maybe the live action bits would be a saving grace. Uh, because it doesn't have the Cronenberg mashup of Rugrats and McDonald's characters. And you'd be wrong. I mean, there's Ronald McDonald, and he looks fine. I mean, as someone who was never scared of clowns, I always thought Ronald was, like, the least threatening clown ever. I could never imagine someone being scared of that. Some other clowns I understood. If he looked something like his original design, okay, yeah, that's kind of creepy. But the regular old Ronald McDonald that was in this show... No, that's not, that's not scary. What is kind of scary, though, is his grotesque clown dog mannequin. It's so wrong. It's so wrong. And worse than that, he'd get phone calls every episode from his friends, and they would be this terrifying late 90s CG monstrosity. Hey, you're gonna give yourself nightmares watching that stuff. Yeah, a lot of people seem to have uh, trauma associated with these tapes. But I didn't. Because the other tapes my grandmother had were so much worse. Let's talk about Gaither's Pond. Uh, as you can probably see by the clips behind me, this is fucking terrifying. <laughs> I mean, re-watching the Ronald McDonald tapes, all of those memories seemed kind of fresh, like, oh wow, I do remember that, that's a little bit nostalgic. But watching this, it's like I repressed these memories and I was digging them up. I felt uncomfortable watching this. Uh, Gaither's Pond is a uh, video series uh, from famous gospel singing group, the Gaither Vocal Band. Uh, I guess kind of in line with VeggieTales, except so much worse. In every way. I don't really want to say too much about it, because it is so awful. I kind of want to do a full review of it. So hold out. There's going to be a review of this. <laughs> You've been warned. That said, uh, let's go for another easy target. Adam Sandler movies. <laughs> I know I just reviewed one, but uh, I want to talk about this one. Maybe it's a bit of a stretch to say Bedtime Stories was from my childhood. It came out when I was like 12 or 13, and I didn't really even like it. I just thought it was okay. This is an okay movie. And then I caught some of it on TV recently, and... What was I thinking? This is a fucking cringe fest. Oh my god, everything is so embarrassing. 
Uh, Sailor's character is pathetic and lacks any type of self-awareness. Which is fine in a movie where he's playing a dumb character like the Water Boy or even Little Nicky. Those characters are clearly not very intelligent. But the main character of this movie, uh, Brenner, I believe his name is. My bad. Skeeter. But Sandler's character in this movie, Skeeter, is so sure of himself. He's just constantly spouting out jokes and making fun of people. And he's so pathetic. And beyond that, he's kind of a sad sack defeatist even. That's not what I want to see in my Sandler films. He tries hooking up with this Paris Hilton stand-in character, which is a joke that's aged wonderfully, by the way. Paris Hilton, still as relevant as ever. And then he ends up with this other chick, and it's just... Terrible. <laughs> like, I, I have trouble describing how embarrassed I feel for this character. Constantly. Like, it's hard to feel embarrassed for a dumb character. But this is not a dumb character. Sandler is playing someone on the level of himself, and he doesn't realize how cringy he is being. And it just makes my skin crawl. Oh. Let's, let's move on, okay? Um, I was gonna try to round out this list with a video game. And I went through a couple options. I mean, I already threw out Barney and uh, Thomas and the Magic Railroad, so maybe I shouldn't mention the Pooh game. Uh, Scooby-Doo and Cyber Chase looks terrible on revisits. I, it looked way better than this in my memory. Um, I even thought about talking about the iToy for the PlayStation 2, although my memory of that has mostly faded. So let's instead talk about Sonic Heroes. Uh, like many PlayStation owners, this was my first Sonic game because it was the first Sonic game available on PlayStation. And it's not good. I mean, the Sonic levels are pretty fun. And I kind of liked Team Dark Story. Then there was the third team. Team Chow, maybe? I don't remember. Amy, I've always thought, is an annoying character. And Cream is just Amy's version of Tails. And I also am really annoyed by Tails. Like, Amy's passable. Cream is fucking obnoxious. And you think maybe there's some solace in Big the Cat, but no, he spends the entire game talking about Froggy. Oh, we gotta find Froggy, guys. Where's Froggy? Froggy, Froggy, Froggy. How is that the same voice actor as Duke Nukem? And then there was the fourth team. I don't even remember what they were called. I don't remember any of their names. It was a, it was a bee, a crocodile, and... Rhinoceros? I think he had a horn. I don't remember. In fact, I find myself not remembering a lot of this game. I remember the Green Hill Zone levels, but... Uh... No, most of it has faded from my memory. Basically, the only memorable part of this game is the theme song, which is one of the most distinct songs in the Sonic franchise. I mean, you can't even say Sonic Heroes without someone just going, Sonic Heroes! Sonic Heroes! I said distinct, not best. And... I think that's all I have to talk about from my childhood that didn't hold up. Until I dig up some other repressed memories. Um, let me know in the comments what you liked as a kid that you think is terrible now. Or just, you know, steal this idea, make a whole video about it. Please, I I'd love to know what everyone else liked as a kid but is terrible now. Uh, until then, I'm Matt, and I hope you all have a nice day.